about a, an experimental method that we can use for getting information about the molar mass distributions of polymers. It's called gel permeation or size exclusion chromatography, depending on which book you read. And uh, what we saw is that in this technique, which is a form of liquid chromatography, in which you pass uh, a solvent through a packed column, column packed with porous beads, and then inject a sample of your polymer in solution, we get separation on the basis of size. We talked about the mechanism of that. We saw that the biggest molecules come out first, so if we have a true size-based separation, well, it's a size-based separation <laughs> based on the hydrodynamic volume, which is a concept we'll come back to again today. But if we calibrate it, we can then uh, turn that into a molar mass distribution. But today we're going to learn about another technique which gives us a bit of extra information that we can use in conjunction with GPC when we haven't got samples to calibrate our column width of the particular polymer that we're interested in. So yesterday we talked about gel permeation chromatography. Today we're going to talk about dilute solution viscometry and how we can use some information from that together with GPC and also potentially other uh, experimental techniques in what's known as multi-detector GPC. <coughs> Press the button. Can you turn the mic off or something? You see, it just keeps going on and off. It's kind of. In that case, let's forget about that. Forget the mic. If you can't hear me, you have to move to the front. Okay, so when we're talking about GPC, has anyone else got a secret stash of handouts? Ah, there's one. Oh. There you go. So you must love these handouts so much, you want multiple copies. Okay, if there are any more, this lady will probably need one. Okay, we're talking. When we talk about GPC, when we talk about viscometry, <laughs> these are examples of things which depend on hydrodynamic properties. Hydrodynamics, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is the science of forces acting on or exerted by fluids. And today we're going to be thinking in particular about how a polymer can change the way in which a liquid flows. And uh, you should be aware that there are actually different types of flow that you may encounter. If we have a liquid flowing through a pipe, then in the simplest case, the liquid right near the edges of the pipe is actually not going anywhere. And the liquid right in the middle of the pipe is going to the fastest speed. And you can imagine that liquid having little layers which are going at different velocities through that pipe, in the simplest case with a parabolic flow profile. And so one little imaginary plane of liquid is moving faster than its neighboring plane. It's this sort of a motion. And that sort of a motion is known as shear, and so that can be called shear flow, S-H-E-A-R. Now you should also be aware there are other kinds of flow which can be important. For example, when we have an acceleration, and that's often important in processing, where you might be pushing a solution to a little uh, orifice of some kind, and uh, uh, pulling perhaps a fibre, so we actually get extension as well as flow. Now, I'm not going to talk about that sort of flow here, I'm only going to talk about shear flow today, but you ought to be aware that other types of flow are also important. And what we say about things like viscosity in relation to shear flow, there are parallel ideas in relation to extensional flow. But we're just going to focus on shear flow. And if you haven't uh, met this before, just give you a tiny bit of background before we start talking about what we really want to talk about. So we're thinking about a simp the simplest kind of shear flow where we can imagine that we have a liquid flowing, that might be through a tube, between two plates, between the uh, particles in a GPC column or whatever. And in the simplest case we have laminar flow, that means we can imagine the liquid is in little layers, very small thin layers, which are uh, moving at, with different velocities relative to each other. And so we can then think about, uh, if we think about two of those imaginary layers in our flowing liquid, we can define a stress. A stress is a force per unit area. And because this is a shear motion, 
We're talking about a shear stress, which is effectively the force exerted by one of these little imaginary planes on the, on the next. And we imagine they're a little tiny distance apart, dz. And of course, because the velocities are different, we have a velocity gradient, dv, where the fastest little layer is moving that little bit faster than its neighbor. So, it, so the velocity gradient is the v by dz. Or you can also express that as a shear rate. So in some books, you'll see it referred to as a velocity <coughs> gradient. In some books, you'll see it referred to as a shear rate. And you may find a shear rate, the symbol gamma, with a little dot over the top. So if we think about a liquid flowing like that, uh, there's the force associated with how one plane moves next to, relative to the next plane in that liquid. And then there's the velocity gradient or shear rate. We can ask, what's the simplest sort of flow we can imagine? When, in science, whenever we start thinking about something, we always start thinking about the simplest things, don't we? So we think about gases, we start thinking about ideal gases, and then we worry about making it a bit more complicated. And it's just like this, if we're thinking about a liquid flowing, what's the simplest sort of flow we can imagine? Well, that's what we refer to as Newtonian flow, from good old Newton. And the simplest flow, what sort of flow we can imagine is where the shear stress is directly proportional to the velocity gradient or the shear rate. And so we can say tau for shear stress equals some constant of proportionality times either the v by dz or gamma with a little dot over the top. And that coefficient of proportionality is what we call viscosity. If you're an engineer, then this is what we call a dynamic viscos viscosity because they distinguish between that and a kinematic viscosity, which takes that and divides it by density. But viscosity, now that we all have a, should have an idea of what viscosity is about. It's about how easily something flows. So treacle or tar is very viscous and water is less viscous and some organic liquids are less viscous and still. But this enables us to define a coefficient of viscosity. And it has units. And if we're working with the SI system, then the units of viscosity will be kilograms per meter per second. Very often we'll see viscosities quoted in the old-fashioned CGS units. Uh, and the CGS unit of viscosity is the poise, which is a gram per centimeter per second. And in fact, you'll often find viscosities expressed not as poises, but as centipoids, because they produce useful numbers. Now, I'm telling you that so you're aware of what a viscosity really is. Because in this lecture, I'm going to talk about a number of things that are called viscosity, and actually they aren't. They're related in some way to viscosity, they aren't strictly a viscosity because they don't have these units. So I wanted to start out by making clear what something that's a real viscosity is, what the units are, but a little later we're going to see things where we say viscosity, but they're not really a viscosity at all. There's something else, as we'll see. So what, I'm, what I want to do now is to use the way in which a polymer changes the viscosity of a liquid, use that to get some information about the size of the molecules that we have. As we, we can imagine, if we've got a, a coil and it's really long and dangly, it's, that's going to make a liquid flow less easily than a really small molecule. So this, there must be some kind of relationship between the viscosity of a polymer solution and the molar mass, or at least the size in some way, of that polymer. And in fact, this was one of the first techniques that was used to get information about the sizes of polymer molecules. So when we dissolve a polymer in a liquid, in general, the viscosity will be increased. And how much it's increased, well, it'll depend on the concentration of polymer, of course, but also on the size of the molecules. And so we have a handle on one of the things you want to know about how big are these molecules. And uh, what we're going to see is how we can calculate something called an intrinsic viscosity. Uh, but what we'll see is that it's not a viscosity. It's a measure of how good the polymer is at making a solution more viscous. It's a measure of viscosifying power. Add another name, limiting viscosity number, that's not a good name either because it's not a number as we'll see. But these are, the, these are the phrases which you'll find in the books. So how are we going to measure this? And what I'll do is I'll talk about the good old-fashioned way of measuring it, 
Um, it's simple to understand and actually it's still used very often because it involves very simple equipment. It can be anywhere in the world and this is an experiment that it's easy to do. Well, fairly easy to do. Actually, you need to be careful cleaning your equipment and temperature control and things. But essentially all you need is a fancy bit of glassware. So here's, in fact, the simplest viscometer is just a U-tube and with one of the U's as a capillary. But this is a slightly more practical, a slightly more complex type of uh, viscometer, a capillary viscometer, and this type is called an Ublone viscometer. And it's just a fancy bit of glassware. We've got three arms, which on the diagram are called A, B, and C. And C has got a capillary. Here's the capillary. And you can have different sized capillaries depending on what range of viscosity you want to look at. And above the capillary, there's a little uh, glass bulb, and there should be, although this one's actually been broken and fixed, so this is absolutely no good, except as a lecture demonstration. But if you look above that bulb, you see a little inscribed line, and there should be another inscribed line just below it, and the distance between those lines defines a set volume. You'll also see that there's a little bulb down in, uh, below the capillary with an extra arm, which we call B, attached to it. And then below that, that disappears into a tube with a, an extra bulb, so we've got some volume there. And this is it. So that's the basic bit of equipment. So that, that's quite simple. You need to clean it up very carefully. You need a constant temperature bath to immerse it in, to control the temperature. Um, uh, but basically, that's all you need. You, you normally have a little um, uh, suction device to help, as we'll see in a moment, uh, do your measurements. So what would be involved? Well, we take our viscometer, we mount it nice and vertically in a constant temperature bar. We're going to take a, well, either pure solvent or a polymer solution. And uh, if we take our solution, we will pipette it into this bulb at the bottom into the bottom through A. So we're going to put some solution in the bottom here. Okay. Either polymer solution or, as we'll see, we also need to do the same measurement with some pure solvent without any polymer there at all. And you'll also see we're going to do measurements for different concentrations of polymers. But this is designed so that we can start with a concentrated <coughs> polymer solution and then add some more solvent, shake it up to mix it up well, to dilute it and then do a series of dilutions that way without having to empty it out, clean it out and start again. That's the advantage actually of having this extra little arm, which is arm B on your diagram. So what you do is you've got that in your bath, you've got some solution in the bottom, you will close off B. In the simplest case, you'll put your finger over the end. Have you done this? Yeah, there's someone here who knows exactly what I'm talking about. Where have you done this? In, class. in your class. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So, and then you're going to suck solution up through the capillary through C. And so you might have a little sort of sucker device that you'll put on the top to pull the solution up until the meniscus is above that top mark. Okay, so once your meniscus... We've got some extra people here. Have you got a handout? Has anyone got any spare copies of the handout? We've still got some spare copies here. Do you want to pass them along so that people can have them? Okay. Once you've sucked solution right up through the capillary to above the upper mark, above this bulb here, you will release the pressure on arm B. What that means is that any solution left below the capillary will just drain back down. <coughs> but if, as long as you've still got suction on this arm C, a column of liquid will remain within the capillary through that bulb to above the upper mark, which is marked X there. So it's, the solution there then is suspended. This is, called, this is an example of a suspended level viscometer because it's designed so you can have a suspended solution. And the point of that is it then doesn't matter how much solvent is left over, which is why you can dilute a solution and still get it to work. You then release the pressure on C and let the solution flow back through the capillary. And you sit there with a the stopwatch, is that what you did? In the simplest case, 
if you're, you know, these days you might have an automated equipment with, some, with a little photo diode or something, but in the simplest case, it's you and a stopwatch. And you wait for the meniscus to reach that line X, and then you click on the stopwatch, and then you let the solution flow until it gets to line Y, and you click off the stopwatch, and now you've got a measurement. And your measurement is the time it takes for that volume of solution to flow through that capillary. That's your basic measurement. How long does it take for that solution to flow through that capillary? And as I said, you will need to do that for your solvent, and you will generally do it for various polymer concentrations. And because this is a suspended level voscometer, we can dilute a polymer solution internally. To have the simplest sort of voscometer stuff for you two, after each measurement, you've got to take out the, the solution, clean it, and put in exactly the same volume of the next solution. So that gets a bit awkward. So these are a bit clever. So that's a very simple measurement, really. And what we're going to do with this. Now, what we're interested in here, actually, you know, I started out with defining viscosity, and they said we're not going to deal with viscosities, because what we're interested in is not what the actual viscosity is. We don't measure that at all here. But how much more viscous our solution is than the solvent. In other words, we're interested in a relative viscosity, the ratio of the viscosity of our polymer solution to the viscosity of the solvent with no polymer there at all. And if we make a few approximations, the ratio of the viscosities is simply the ratio of the times. The time measured for polymer solution and the time measured for pure solvent through the same capillary. That is an approximation. You, depending on circumstances, you may need to do some corrections. But in the simplest case, if we've got the right capillary for the solution we're dealing with, that's a good enough approximation. So if we just take the ratio of times, that is near enough to our relative viscosity. And it's a ratio. It has no units because it's one viscosity divided by another. Now what we really want to know is actually not the relative viscosity, but the relative increase in viscosity. In other words, what's the difference in viscosity brought about our polymer ratio to the viscosity of the solvent? <coughs> And if you work it out, you can make, work out that very simply, because that's simply the relative viscosity, minus 1. So there's no difficult maths at this point. So we're going to call that specific viscosity. So it's eta with a little sp for specific as a subscript. And note again that this is a pure number. It's, a, it's all ratios. There are no units. It's not a viscosity. Remember we saw that viscosity had units. This hasn't got units, even though it's called a viscosity. Now, what we really want to know is how, how is the actual polymer chain, really want to know is what, how does a single polymer chain affect our solution? Because we never have a single polymer chain, we're always working at a finite concentration. And if you change the concentration, the viscosity will change. So, as is often the case when one's doing experiments, we need to extrapolate. We need a way of working out what we ought to get if we had just one molecule. Effectively, we've got to extrapolate to zero concentration or infinite dilution. And uh, so we need a way of extrapolating. We need some idea of how the, these quantities, the relative viscosity or the specific viscosity, might depend on concentration. And there are a couple of equations that help us. One of them says, if we take the specific viscosity, divide it by concentration. So now you have something. Remember, specific viscosity is just a number. Divide it by concentration. You now have something with units which are reciprocal of whatever concentration units we're working with. And if we plot that against concentration, we should get a more or less straight line. The other thing you can do is to take the natural log, log to the base E, ln, of the relative viscosity, and divide all of that by concentration. And approximately, if you plot that against concentration, you get a straight line. Now, those of you who are mathematically bright, and remembering that uh, the specific viscosity is just the relative viscosity minus 1, will realize that these two equations cannot simultaneously be true. But 
in the limit of very low concentration, they're near enough true. Okay, so we've got two equations which give more or less straight lines. The bottom one isn't quite a straight line, but it's close enough at low concentration. And they should all have the same intercept on the y-axis, and that intercept is what we're going to call our intrinsic viscosity. And we're going to symbolize that by an eta, the Greek letter eta, in square brackets. So our intrinsic viscosity is what we get if we take either the specific viscosity divided by concentration and extrapolate to zero concentration. So that's the limit as C tends to zero of that quantity, quantity specific viscosity divided by concentration. Or, um, as a slightly more of an approximation, if we take the natural log of the relative viscosity divided by concentration. And as I've mentioned, Sometimes you may need to apply corrections with an ideal case. Um, that will be good enough. And we'll notice that the units of intrinsic viscosity are that whatever concentration units we've got, it's those units upside down. So we're taking the number divided by concentration. It's not units of viscosity. So this isn't really a viscosity. So some years ago, a committee said, well, we shouldn't really call this intrinsic viscosity because it's got a viscosity. Let's give it another number, another name. And what they came up with was limiting viscosity number. But it's not a number either, because it's got units. So that isn't a very good name, so it hasn't really taken off. You'll find both names in books, but most commonly it's still called intrinsic viscosity. Just remember, strictly it's not a viscosity, but that's what it's called. Now what we really want to know is, okay, we've got this quantity, why is it useful? Well, it's telling us about how a polymer changes the viscosity of a liquid, and we've already said that's all to relate to molar mass. So there should be a relationship between intrinsic viscosity and molar mass. And empirically, there is. For any particular polymer in a particular solvent at a particular temperature, and actually over a certain range of molar masses, you find empirically that uh, a relationship, you have a relationship with the form intrinsic viscosity is some constant times molar mass raised to the power of something, we'll, we'll call that power A. Uh, or in other words, log intrinsic viscosity is log a constant K plus A times log A. Again, this is, this is empirical. If you change the polymer, if you change the solvent, the K and the A values change. The A value actually tells us something about the solvent. I haven't talked about theta solvents particularly on this course. A theta solvent is a kind of ideal solution for a polymer. <coughs> it's a polymer in a particular sol solvent at a particular temperature where the polymer behaves ideally in terms of its statistical behavior. It's where, the, in fact, the finite volume of the polymer is it just exactly counterbalanced by the tendency for polymer segments to interact with each other rather than with solvent molecules. And it marks the transition from a good solvent, where the coil wants to be <coughs> swollen with solvent, and a poor solvent, where the coil doesn't really want like the solvent, and it's going to contract, and eventually it will precipitate out. In a theta solvent, that value of A is for a linear flexible polymer is 0.5. For the sort of solvents we normally study polymers in, the value of A is usually around 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, that sort of range. If we have a polymer which is actually like a rigid rod, a very extended rigid polymer, that value of A might be quite large, it might be 1.7, 1.8. If we have a highly branched polymer which is very compact and dense, that value of A will be quite small, it might be down to 0 0.3, 0 0.2. If you go to the limit of a solid sphere, there is actually no size dependence. So the value of that A is telling us something about the solvent and the polymer. And you might say, um, okay, do we have to work this out every time, every time we have a polymer? Um, as you might imagine, for a lot of polymers, people have done these experiments often years ago. And so in the literature, there are lots and lots of bits of information for different polymers, different solvents, different temperatures, things like K and A values. Where do you get all of this stuff? Well, this is a useful book, the Polymer Handbook. It's a good, big, solid book, this. This is really old-fashioned stuff, none of your internet stuff. This is where you get the real data. 
lots and lots of information about polymers, including page after page after page of Mark Lewin coefficients, 10 day values for different polymers, different solvents. But as always, when you're looking at data, you have to be a little bit critical. Because you'll find for the same polymer, <coughs> supposedly under the same conditions, you might get quite different KNA values. So what do you use? <laughs> well, you as a scientist have to make a judgment. And you'll find the information. You'll gather the reference. You can go back and look at the original work. It'll tell you things like how many samples were used, what was used to measure molar mass. So if, if this comes from a lab where they've, they've just taken two or three samples and they tried to get a relationship and they've used the peli core technique for measuring molar mass, you're not going to trust it very much. If they've taken a lot of effort to work with fractionated samples and they've used a very careful method to get your M data, then you're more likely to trust it. And also, because it is, these KNAs aren't really quite constant, they do change over a broad molar mass range. So if you're dealing with a fairly small polymer, the KNA values won't be quite the same as if it's a really massive polymer of the same type. So you will look for values which were obtained over the same molar mass range that you're interested in. So you can't just take numbers out of a book like this and use them without thinking about them. You're the scientists. You're the ones with the brains. And you always have to have an intellectual input to how you interpret the data you get from the literature or from your experiments. Now, why is this particularly interesting to us? To us and how does this relate to what we were talking about yesterday, which was GPC? I said these were all to do with hydrodynamics, all to do with how fluids flow. If we take, now remember, in terms of viscosity, the units are a reciprocal concentration. The concentration is always weight per unit volume. Um, nowadays, if you go to the recent editions of the polymer handbook, you'll find that intrinsic viscosities are usually quoted in cubic centimetres per gram, because the concentration units are grams per cubic centimetre. If you go to slightly older books, you'll find they're commonly quoted in decilitres per gram. Watch out. If you get the units wrong, your answers will be wrong. As always when you're doing calculations, the units are key. If you mess up with the units, you get the wrong answers. Um, and you very rarely get it in SI units, incidentally. So you're most commonly, nowadays, can't find intrinsic viscosity is quoted in cubic centimeters per gram, in slightly older literature, in deciliters per gram. Uh, but what we have then is something which is a volume divided by a mass. Molar mass is a mass per mole. So multiply the two together, we have a volume per mole. It's measure some kind of volume. It's proportional to some kind of volume. What volume is it? It's a hydrodynamic volume. This is all about hydrodynamics. Now, in other words, the product of intrinsic viscosity and molar mass is proportional to the hydrodynamic volume of our solute. And remember, in GPC, we said that the separation was based on hydrodynamic volume. So that gives us exactly what we're interested in. We'll come back to that in a moment. But let's just look at some data and see how we would actually work out an intrinsic viscosity if you've got some data from a, bit of a, from a viscometer like this one. This is very simple, only three concentrations. You'd really want to work with more, but this is just to make it nice and easy to see how things work. What we've got is three concentrations. You will note in this question, here's the flow time for pure toluene. Here's been put in the question, 120 seconds. If we had another column here with zero concentration, then that's pure solvent. If you have an exam question, you need to know the flow time for pure solvent. It might be in the question, it might be in the table. It'll be there somewhere. There have been cases where students have been in the exam after they said, we didn't have the flow time for the solvent. Yes, they did. They just didn't spot it. <laughs> You've got times for three concentrations. To get the relative viscosity, you've just got to divide <coughs> by the time for the pure solvent. So if I've done my sums right, we have 1.213, 1.449, 1.707. And 1.707. We can easily subtract one from each of those numbers to get our specific viscosity, 0 0.213, 0 0.449, 0 0.707. Now we can divide the specific viscosity by concentration, 
get what's sometimes called a reduced viscosity, 53.2, 56.1, 58.9. Or we can take the natural log of our relative viscosity and divide that by concentration. We've got 48.3, 46.4, 44.6. And now we've got all the data we need to get to an intrinsic viscosity. In fact, twice over, because we've got two different extrapolations we can do. Often a good idea to do both, because if we made a mistake, it might well show up if we get vastly different answers. So we need to plot those things. So we need to, if you're in an exam, there's always graph paper available. Ask for some graph paper, come and given it. Use the space available on the sheet of graph paper so you can plot things precisely. Make sure you put units on the axes and uh, things like label things properly. And we've got some data for specific viscosity divided by concentration, which we can extrapolate to zero concentration. We've got data for the natural log of the relative viscosity divided by concentration, which we can extrapolate to zero concentration. And if all goes well, they should extrapolate to more or less the same point, which is at 50 cubic centimetres per gram. That's our intrinsic viscosity. Now, what you know is experiments always involve a certain amount of experimental error. So if you do this, you may well find they don't quite extrapolate to the same point because data are never perfect. So if it's a little bit of a difference, that's not surprising. Um, and you have to make a judgment as to where you think the origin is. If in doubt, trust the specific viscosity divided by concentration rather than the other one. But if they come out wildly different, a little bit of difference is probably experimental error. Something that's wildly different, you probably made a mistake somewhere. So that's a clue that you should go back and check your work. Now, once we've got our intrinsic viscosity, if we know our mark current parameters, and they were given there in the question, then we can work out a molar mass. Remember, intrinsic viscosity is Km to the A, so we can rearrange that molar mass would be intrinsic viscosity divided by the K raised to the power of 1 over A. Which in this case, works out, if I've done my sums right, so I want to check I've got it right, 125,000 grams per mole. Okay, now one thing we already know is that uh, if we just get a single measurement, it's going to be an average of some kind. And you've met number average, you've met weight average. What sort of average do we get here? I'm, just going to, I'm not going to derive it, or it's possible to derive it. I'm just going to show you to, uh, so you can sort of see how it works. Yeah, these measurements give an average all of their own. It's what we call a viscosity average. And this is just an interesting average. If you remember the number at the end weight average, they just depend on the distribution of molar masses that we've got. But the viscosity average, it's got that little A in there. It starts looking out like the weight average. Instead of saying WIMI, it's MI raised to the power A, and then the whole lot is raised to the 1 over A. And remember that little A value, the mark current parameter A, depends on the nature of the solvent. It'll be different in different solvents. And so this is an average. The value that we get depends not only on the polymer sample we've got, but also on the solvent in which we are looking at it. Change the solvent, you'll get a slightly different value of the average, more or less. <coughs> Otherwise, you're normally working good solvents. The A values will be fairly similar. They won't be very different, but they will be a little bit different. And in practice, it always comes out somewhere between the number and the weight average. It's a bit less than the weight average, a bit more than the number. So how do we use this in GPC? And I've already indicated that in GPC, separation is on the basis of hydrodynamic volume. 
If you remember, when we talked about calibrating, the simplest calibrating, we plotted the log, usually log base to the base 10 of molar mass against dilution volume. And you get a calibration which works for that particular polymer in the solvent that you're using the GPC. But if separation is on the basis of hydrodynamic volume, and the product intrinsic viscosity times molar mass is proportional to the hydrodynamic volume, if instead of plotting log n, we plot the log of that product, we should have a calibration that works for any polymer, as long as we've got the intrinsic viscosity information. Since intrinsic viscosity is Km to the A, we can also write in intrinsic viscosity times molar mass is Km to the A times M, which is Km to the 1 plus A. So we've got a couple of different ways in which we should be able to generate a calibration which ought to work for any <coughs> But we need a bit of extra information. We need to know about how this intrinsic viscosity depends on molar mass for the particular polymer that we've got. Now in your, I think in your handout, I actually gave you some data so you can work it through for yourselves. We're not going to go through it all together, but I'll show you, but, these are the, but this data is based on the same results. So these were some results obtained here quite a few years ago by a PhD student from Brazil. It's actually for the same polysaccharide that we saw the complex bimodal molar mass distribution of yesterday. <coughs> and what this student did is was to take the pot, this complex polysaccharide, fractionate it um, with a solvent non solvent system to get fractions of different molar mass, measured the molar mass by an absolute method, in fact, light scattering, measured the intrinsic viscosity. <coughs> but first of all, and, and, and did some GPC. First of all, we looked at the conventional calibration. So this is the normal GPC calibration, where we have log of m on the left-hand axis. This is a logarithmic axis. We've got 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 7. So this is log m against solution volume. And this is aqueous GPC, not easy to do. And it was calibrated with polyoxyethylene. So these red circles are the results for polyoxyethylene standards. So that's the polyoxyethylene calibration. And these blue triangles are the results for the polysaccharide, the real results for the polysaccharide. And what we can see is that the calibrations are completely different. If you remember I said yesterday, what people often do is they will take the calibration for one polymer, polystyrene if it's an organic solvent, polyoxetylene if it's an aqueous solvent, and apply that to an unknown polymer as if it, as if it worked. And if we do that, and in the literature for polysaccharides, you will find people doing this. If we take the polyoxyethylene calibration, for this sample, for example, we have a, the polyoxyethylene calibration would say that the, the molar mass is a, a couple of hundred thousand. And the real molar mass is more than an order of magnitude greater than that, several million. That's how wrong your conventional calibration can be. If you treat it as polyoxyethylene, you think it's just a couple of hundred thousand. Actually, when you study it, in this case, it's several million. Why is that? Because this is a very complex branch polysaccharide. So you've got a lot of mass in a relatively small volume. But if we take the same data, but include the intrinsic viscosity data, or the KNA values in this case, <coughs> So plot it as a universal calibration. So this is, again, it's a logarithmic scale, 10 to 3, 10 to 4, 10 to 5. This is now Km to the 1 plus A. These points all fall on more or less the straight line. Go to the literature, we'll see that people have sort of modified that universal calibration a little bit. I'm going to say it should be just E to M, it should be E to M to a little power. But within experimental error, it's a good enough approximation. Even comparing something as different as linear a linear synthetic polymer like polyoxyethylene and a highly branched natural polymer, in this case from a Brazilian tree known as an anadenentra macrocarp. It's a tree exudate. It's the one that is taken from the gum. If you, if you put a cut in the trunk, a gum comes out, and from that gum you can isolate this polysaccharide. So, so, that, that sort of demonstrates how powerful the universal calibration is. If you can actually, if you've got the Mark Twain's information, relate very different polymers. 
and it works very well for most polymers. There are some exceptions, but generally it works well. So let's go back now to think about gel permeation or size exclusion chromatography. Now, what we said yesterday was that we have a detector. We said that it was usually a refractive index detector. Sometimes it might be a UV detector or something like that. But the point of that detector is to tell us what concentration of polymer is coming off the column at some point in time. If we add other detectors, then we can start to do other things. So we can um, then be a bit more clever by actually not having to calibrate at all, or actually start studying structural differences as well as molar mass differences. So uh, here we have a student, actually finished now, in, back in Saudi Arabia, but he was working on a multi-detector GPC. And uh, upstairs, the GPC, we've actually got several detectors, potentially. We actually have two different light scattering detectors. Now, when we take talks about light scattering, um, I would have said a bit more about it if the fire alarm hadn't gone off last week. But essentially, if we study how light is scattered from a polymer solution, we can get, we, we, uh, and with a bit of extra information about the refractive index increment, we can get an absolute weight average molar, molar mass. And if we have a light scattering detector on our GPC system, then that means, coupled with the concentration data, we can actually monitor the molar mass of the polymer coming off the column. So we can get a molar mass distribution absolutely, at least in principle, there are some practical complications, uh, without having to calibrate with standards. We also have a viscosity detector. Now, obviously, we can't take that and stick that on the end of a, G on a, on a chromatography system. It's a slightly more sophisticated approach to the same thing. It still involves a capillary. Um, does anyone know what a weak stone bridge is? Anyone done a physics? Weak stone bridge? Weak stone bridges? No, not. There must be someone here who's met a weak stone bridge. <laughs> Okay, it's the good old-fashioned way of me measuring electrical resistance, where you have four resistors in a, in, in a sort of a, an arrangement like that. You met, and uh, um, if you've got an unknown resistance and you vary another resistance, you can work out the resistance of your unknown. So if you, if you know that, then it's quite clever to realize you can do the same thing with discometry. You actually effect, have some capillaries in the same sort of arrangement, and you use that to work out an effective viscosity. Uh, so there is, a, there is a way of actually measuring viscosity on a very compact instrument, which you can put on the end of a column. But if you remember, what we need is, um, to get our intrinsic viscosity, is we want to know the concentration dependence. But of course, coming off a GPC column, we just have one concentration at any given time. But because it's dilute, we can get an approximate value Instead of doing an extrapolation, there's an approximation where we take the specific viscosity, the log of the relative viscosity, work out roughly what the intrinsic viscosity would be from those two values <laughs> for a given concentration. So it's an approximation, but it works well enough as long as we're very dilute. And that means that with one measurement of the effective specific viscosity and relative viscosity of the solution as it comes off the column, we can get an intrinsic viscosity. And that then means, for example, we can apply our universal calibration. Because we're measuring uh, <coughs> intrinsic viscosity for the sample as it appears. So if we've got a polystyrene calibration, we know the KMA values for that. We've got the intrinsic viscosity for our node. We've got all we need to work out a true molar mass, even if we haven't got the light scattering detector. Or if we've got additional mass information, say from the light scattering detector, then we can start to look at other things. Because for the same molar mass, for example, a branch polymer will have a smaller hydrodynamic volume than a linear polymer. So we can start to get information about how much branching we've got in our polymer and things like that. So with, by adding different detectors to our GPC system, we can start getting much more information about our polymer sample. And that is all you're going to get from me. I'll see you again on Monday.